Would you stand and listen for the gospel of the Lord? This morning we're reading from Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. Jesus is speaking and says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evil doers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. So the man was driving along and saw the police lights in the rearview mirror and pulled over. The police officer gets out of the car, comes up to the window, notices the driver is alone, has on a clergy collar. Ask him, the police officer asks the driver, have you been drinking? The man said, nothing but water, sir. And he said, why is there such a strong smell of wine coming from your car? And the driver says, oh, my Lord, he's done it again. <laughs> Jesus challenges in our passage today those who claim to be followers of his, claim to be doing the work of his, and yet do not appear to really be doing the work of God. The challenge comes to us as well. Here we are reading from what's known as the Sermon on the Mount in the seventh chapter. But we remember that this started way back in chapter 5. The very first part of chapter 5, Matthew records this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying... So we have a large crowd, the 12 disciples and the others who are part of the traveling band following Jesus are there, but there are many, many others there on that day who have joined them for this Sermon on the Mount or the time here on the side of the hill. Therefore, knowing there are large crowds who have come, we can assume different levels of commitment. Not all of them coming with the same fire and desire and understanding to be a follower of Christ. I read recently a story about a college football player, by all accounts, is super talented, but not yet fulfilled his potential, shall we say, in the college ranks. They were interviewing him, and the interviewer said, do you think this year might be your year? And he said, well, yes, sir, I do. The coaches say, if I just show up every day ready to bring it, if I do my best, if I'm here every day in practice ready to work, they say I can really make a difference. He said that like so many players do, as if that's a new revelation, a new insight. That's a basic, right, to be part of a successful team. You've got to show up every time you're supposed to show up and do your part and bring your best. But you hear it all the time in athletics. Now, maybe it's because most of these guys are 19, 20, 21-year-old people with immense talent. and Maybe they have not had to work very hard up to this point to excel, to be noticed, to be a star. But those comments about showing up, doing your part, being ready to work hard and fulfill your role and stay committed are just the basics of successful teams, or the basics, really, of showing up as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus has some harsh words for those who show up but are not ready to do the work, are not ready, as he puts it, to do the will of God. Jesus, some of these Words are the harshest words we hear him speak. He's speaking to those without commitment. Chapter 5 begins with all these blessings, blessings for everyone, begins with God's grace. But by the time he gets here near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to the crowd still, but he's talking about commitment and how we respond 
through the grace of God being offered to us. And Jesus says, claiming his name or calling him Lord is not enough to make one a disciple. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Disciples of Jesus walk the talk. Disciples of Jesus do the work. Disciples of Jesus stay the course even when the going gets tough. Disciples of Jesus are called to do the will of God. Today, we mark the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. I would say our city has made progress from that terrible, tragic, horrific day and then all the intervening years of denying and suppressing what really happened to beginning to explore the history and to learn a little more truth about what actually happened to beginning to try to figure out how we repair the harm that was done so many years ago. Yet I think it's important that we remember the harsh reality not only of the burning of a great section of our city, but the white population for the most part did nothing to stop it and pretty well ignored it after it happened. Unfortunately, the white churches were part of that as well, doing very little. The Sunday after the riot, we have copies of many sermons, lots of comments that were made in white churches. Mostly they ignored it, or if they spoke about it, they justified it. Boston Avenue Church was down the street at 5th and Boston. That day they had a guest preacher. Bishop Edwin Muzon was a bishop in the Methodist Episcopal Church South, the church that was started, split away from the North Church to endorse slavery, to say it was okay to have slaves and be a Christian. Bishop Muzon grew up in South Carolina. He was residing in Dallas, Texas. He was here, preached at Boston Avenue Sunday morning, preached that evening at Centenary United Methodist Church on North Denver. I want to share a little bit of what he said in that sermon. He kind of assessed the situation and said, well, this really happened because of outside agitators some angry black citizens in the KKK. Then he said he wanted to make several constructive suggestions. His first point went like this. We must give our colored friends to understand that there will never be anything like social equality in America. And at the same time, we must see to it that there is nothing resembling race hatred or race contempt in our hearts. He went on to quote another bishop, though, admiringly, Bishop Haas, who said, God Almighty has drawn the color line in indelible ink. Bishop Muzon elaborated, the more that line is respected, the better it will be for both whites and blacks. We will see to it that here in America there are separate hotels and separate schools and separate churches. He went on to blame the angry black citizens for starting the violence. That's pretty questionable. He was condescending when he spoke about the black community in general. Yet he also criticized the mob action of the whites and said this, The mob is never to be defended. It is always to be condemned. Never excuse the mob. Never apologize for the mob. Then he spoke of raising the level of our morality as followers of Christ. He condemned lawlessness and encouraged cooperation between Christians across racial lines in Tulsa. Then he concluded like this, and this leads to my last suggestion. 
Let us who are citizens of Tulsa take each his full measure of blame for this disgrace. And we, the Christian people of Tulsa, must bear our part of this burden of guilt. Some of us have not made any proper connection between our religion and the affairs of our everyday life, the bishop said. Our religion has been a thing apart from life. We have thought of it as having to do with eternity rather than time and history. And so we have read our Bible, said our prayers, and we have come to church. But we have failed to make any connection with life. Our religion has been a form of selfishness. We have sunk into miserable individualism. Let this tragedy shake us out of our heresy of thought and of life. We are bound up in the one bundle of life. We are members one of another. Religion has to do with life. It must be carried into business. It must be carried into civic life. Then in the final paragraph of his sermon, He pointed the people of Boston Avenue back to Christ with these words, Let us dare to follow Jesus. If we build on his teachings, we build on the rock, a house which rain and floods and wind cannot destroy. Then he quotes this very chapter from which we've read this morning, the very next verse from what we read. And every one that heareth these words and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and smote upon that house and great was the fall thereof. Now we would not agree, I do not think, with all that he said that day. But in his defense, he was more moderate than many, and he did condemn the violence and the hate that were exhibited on that day. And when he talked about faith, Bishop Muzon says, it is not enough to talk. We must act. We must build. We must rise and be bold in our faith, he said. When we're dealing with race relations, we must be doers of the will of God. We must have love in our hearts for others whom we see as different. Or as Jesus said in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Dr. Robert P. Jones, who wrote the book Why Too Long, was our distinguished Barton Clinton Gordy lecturer this year, who's done amazing work on all of these racial issues, particularly how they have played out in the church, entitled his last chapter of his book Reckoning. Reckoning. He says reckon has Two meanings, I've put them in your outline. He says the first is to give a full verbal accounting. And then he goes on to talk about truth-telling and accurate history. But then he goes on to say there's a second meaning, which is to make a fair settling of financial accounts. He says, and I agree, both apply to race relations in America today. He says if we want to think about it as people of faith, if we want to talk about it in theological language, what we would call it in Christian life is confession and repair. Confession and repair. That is, we have to recognize the wrong that has been done in any situation, and then as Christians respond as best we can to make it right. As Jesus says in this passage from Matthew in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. If we want a solid foundation, if we want to work to improve our city, to make for better race relations, we've got to be on a journey It's a journey of faith, but it's a journey with others to hear those who were wronged, to understand what happened, and to think about what might make that right 
in this city and in our lives today. In Christian liturgy, you'll always see a pattern where you're invited by the liturgy and the litany to make confession before you hear the proclamation of the good news. Christians have believed all along without confession and repentance, then there are still obstacles to receiving the fullness of God's grace or the fullness of the gospel. Might be an obstacle you're holding, might be an obstacle that's clinging to you and holding you back. So confession and repentance are important steps in our faith journey. Of course, you'll see it in the liturgy today that we'll do confession and then hear words of pardon before we move into the great thanksgiving and proclaiming the good news. Christians have always believed this is the path to right relationships with God and with one another. And then once we hear the proclamation of the good news, we are empowered as disciples of Christ to move into the world, to act decisively on God's behalf. You'll see all of that as we read through the litany today. You can certainly hear it when we finally get to the prayer of consecration just before we come to the table. I will pray these words on our behalf. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give, to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those are powerful words for us to hear. It's a call to be not only a disciple of Christ when we are here, but to move into the world, to be a doer of our faith, to walk the talk, if you will, to do the right thing. Thing, to stay the course even when it's difficult we will not all go and do the same thing but we can all go and do something we can act in faith in the name of Christ I think it would be a way to honor those we have remembered who were faithful that came before us anytime we act in the name of love or justice or reconciliation I think then we are becoming disciples in our own time. I do not think it's too strong to say when we act in those ways in faith in the name of Christ that we are finishing this Sermon on the Mount that we read about today where Jesus calls us to go into the world and be doers of God's will. May it be so. Amen. And thanks be to God.